Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His, and we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May the Lord bless this reading of the Gospels. Today I want to talk to us about a topic that never ceases to amaze me that we have to talk about all the time, and that is the topic of forgiveness. Everybody has an issue with forgiveness. It doesn't strike, it never ceases to fail me how many times I talk to other Christians, other people who go to church week in and week out, who have issues with forgiveness. Sometimes we, have, we don't have issues with every type of issue of forgiveness, but some things we think are particularly egregious. And we weigh out in our minds what is worse than another issue in our lives. So some things we have an easier time to forgive and some things we don't. Some of us have been carrying around a weight for a very long time. 
I've been wearing this backpack throughout the service and some of you have been like, well, that kind of looks a little silly. Why are you wearing that backpack, Pastor? Did you forget about the backpack, Pastor? Now, what I was going to do, by the way, with the backpack, but I didn't have time to figure it all, all the logistics out, was I was going to have different people come up about five minutes at a time and put a different book in the book bag. But I decided that might make me a little tired, carrying around all those books five minutes at a time. But while I look, may look like a ridiculous person carrying around this backpack, I want to ask you this in terms of your spiritual life. Are you carrying around a backpack emotionally and mentally? A backpack that is filled with all kinds of things from our past. And it can be a thing from our past of yesterday, because guess what? Yesterday is the past. An hour ago is the past. How many of us allow things that happen in our past to determine what we're going to do today? You see, the Bible tells us that if the Son sets you free, you're going to be free indeed. This is what the Amplified Version says. So if the Son liberates you and makes you free men and women, then you are really and unquestionably free. But let's ask this question, how many of us feel free? Not many of us feel free. We might think that we're free. But yet, how much of our decisions are based upon, again, what somebody else has done to us? Maybe what we have done to ourselves. Because sometimes, by the way, the greatest person that we need to forgive is the one that we look at in the mirror every day. We need to extend forgiveness to that person, and we need to extend forgiveness to everyone, recognizing that all of us have debts. Interesting that I had a conversation over text message this week with uh, an individual who came to church last Sunday and heard the parable of the prodigal son story and uh, said, well, you know, Pastor, I really disagree with, with the father. I think the father was really messed up for not throwing a party for his son, the older son who was working in the field. And I said, you know what you don't understand is actually this passage that we had read in Matthew's gospel where we all owe a debt. We fail to recognize that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all been given forgiveness. We've all been given grace. And because we've been given grace, because we've been given forgiveness, because we've been given freedom, to whom much is given, much is required. Jesus tells us. So as we have been given grace and we've been given freedom, so we also are commanded and expected to extend that grace and that freedom to everyone around us, including ourselves. But we never get to experience the freedom that is found in Christ, not because somehow the freedom of Christ is lacking, not because God somehow is messed up here, but because we're messed up. Whenever there's some issue, we need to recognize God's not the one that's messed up. We're messed up. Just as we read that parable, the prodigal son story, and find issue with that, that reveals not something about the Father's heart. It reveals something about our hearts, doesn't it? Whenever we deal with unforgiveness in our lives, it restricts us and makes it so that we cannot enjoy the life God wants us to have. In fact, it exhausts us. I'm already carrying around a little bit of weight around my gut. Now I'm carrying around a little weight around my back. And interesting about the weight around our gut, where does the weight around the gut come from? It comes from the things that we put into our mouth, that we allow into our body, that ends up putting on excess weight around us. And what happens when you have excess weight? Well, your back starts to hurt, your knees start to hurt, you start having sugar problems and all kinds of other problems, all because of what we put into ourselves. Same thing happens to us spiritually. The things that we allow to be inside of us, the things that we allow to infect us, actually make us sick. And so when we sit here and have carry around this extra weight, you carry around extra physical weight, it starts hurting your knees. You carry around spiritual weight, and it starts affecting your freedom that you have in Christ. 
It tells us in Galatians 5, 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Christ set you free, so you are free and free indeed. But if you're not experiencing that freedom, then we have to ask ourselves the question, who's causing the problem? And if you say that it's somebody else causing the problem, well, I have something to tell you, that there's always going to be the next issue. There's always going to be the next person that's going to hurt us, the next person that's going to let us down. And we have to decide which master are we going to serve. Are we going to serve the master of our emotions? Are we going to serve the master of our pride that tells us it's okay to be angry and alone? Isn't that dumb? I've said this before, you can be right or you can do right, but you can't always be both. You can't always be both because a lot of people feel that they're right in their lonely self-indignation and they are left all by themselves in their rightness, but also in their loneliness, also in their bitterness. So we have to ask ourselves, who puts us under oppression? If Jesus sets us free, why do so many of us feel oppressed? We feel oppressed because we set ourselves back into prison. We throw ourselves back under the chain and we put on that backpack every morning when we get up. Every morning when we start thinking about how somebody did us wrong. Every morning when we start thinking about how we did ourselves wrong. Every time we start thinking about that, we're putting that backpack on. And when we put that backpack on, isn't it hard enough sometimes just to make it through a day? Why are we adding more on to ourselves when nobody told us we had to have it on there? And if somebody did tell you to put it on, let me tell you about them. They're dumb. If you told yourself that you had to put it on there, then you're dumb. Because here's the thing. Jesus died for the sins of the entire world of all time. He died for all of our guilt. He died for all of our shame. So let me ask you something. If he already died for all that, he already paid off the debt, why are we sitting there paying off something that's already been paid off? That's just dumb. Say it with me. Dumb. Okay. It's, it's helpful to recognize this is a support group. All right. So our freedom in Christ comes through grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So grace is the pathway to engaging that way, engaging that truth, engaging life at its very best. Life at its very best is made possible through grace. And we're going to talk about what grace is because a lot of people don't understand what grace is. A lot of church folk don't know what grace is, don't know how to define it. In Romans 6.14, it says, Sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Let me put it a different way. You are no longer under condemnation. You're no longer under your past. You're no longer under the past of other people. You're no longer under yesterday. Instead, you are free to live today through grace. Today, this moment. So what is grace? I kind of put this a little together this morning. And some of you might have seen before, and some of it you might not have seen before. Grace is the unmerited favor, we all know that, that grants forgiveness to all who will receive. Grace is the, also the unlimited power of God that brings freedom to all who have received it to live as grace-filled followers of Jesus. Grace is not just a matter of canceling debt, but grace is the power to live out the life that God intends for us to live. Grace is the preeminent theological theme of the Bible, if there was one. The preeminent theolo theological theme. Yes, there's love. Yes, there's holiness. Yes, there's faith. But it is grace that makes all of it work. It's grace that makes it all possible. It's, in other words, it's not my work 
Nothing that I can do. I need you to get this. Nothing that I can do. Nothing that you can do. Nothing that our human effort can do. It's all because of God and it's all about God. It all comes from God and it all returns to God. That's what grace is. Grace is us simply allowing God to do what he said he would do in our lives. Grace is surrender and grace is contagious. See, we understand that, it, here's how you know that you don't really understand grace. If you don't understand, you can't give away what you don't understand. You can't give away what you don't have. And so you can have a bank account of a million dollars, but if you never, have any of you seen those unclaimed reward things that are out there that you might have unclaimed money that nobody, that you had no idea about? Just give us your social security number, we'll find out if you have unclaimed money. And there are people that find out that there is unclaimed money out there. Imagine going throughout your whole life thinking, I'm poor, I'm poor, I'm poor. And there was a bank account with a million dollars all along for all of us. That's what grace is to each and every one of us. But we need to recognize that we have access to that bank account. And then when we, have, when we recognize that we have, and when we recognize there was nothing we did for that bank account. There's nothing that we did to deserve that bank account. There's nothing that we could ever do to deserve it. When we recognize that, should that make us stingy? Should that make us bitter or should that make us generous? Should that make us more loving, more gracious? Because somebody left that money for us so we can leave that money to somebody else. It never belonged to me. And guess what? Whether you're rich or poor, I've done funerals. The rich and poor all end up in the same spot, end up in the same way. We are born naked and we die naked. You take nothing in and you take nothing out. So here, that's what grace is all about. And true grace is contagious. So if I have grace, I've used this line that grace is radioactive. Grace doesn't require anything from us. If it required anything from us, it wouldn't be grace. The only thing that it requires from us is to accept it, to grab hold of it. So here it is. I'm giving you this. this I'm giving you this. Would you like it? You really want it? It's great. It makes noise. You want it? You want it? You can have it. There you go. What did he just have to do? He actually had to take it. He couldn't just look at it. He couldn't just hear about it. He had to actually take it. Now, that's not really yours, but, you know, because I'm not as gracious as God, okay? But, you know, yeah. We need it in church here. I'll give you something else. But, but you get the point. And then when I get it, then I become changed by it. Because, by the way, once he has it... Uh, all right, I am going to use you. You got the pink hair, too, so it goes along with it. So can you, can you stand up for a second? Uh, you didn't know this is going to happen to you. Now, now, just walk up and down the pew, well, the aisle. Make noise. There you go. Ah, oh, see, that's what great art. Right, now you can come back. But keep making noise. There you go. There you go. There you go. See, once he takes it, now you can sit down. Good job. Give him a round of applause. Once he takes the grace, his tune starts changing, doesn't it? See, before it might have been, oh, I'm going to church because my grandmother's making me go to church. And now there's a different tune going on in the world, right? He's singing a different tune, and that's what happened. Grace is radioactive. When you take it, it begins to mutate your DNA. The more you saturate yourself with grace, the more you'll be able to understand the parable of the prodigal son story. And here's what you recognize in that parable is that we're all like in this story where Jesus talks about the two people that owed money and the both people get forgiven. And because both people get forgiven, whether you owe $1,000 or you owe $10,000, if you can't pay it, it doesn't matter how much you owe. You just got a debt, doesn't it? And doesn't that weigh on top of you, that debt? 
whether it's a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. And then you know what ends up happening is we get into a debt mentality. We get into a debt mentality. I'm always going to be in debt, so I might as well keep on being in debt. What if I tell you that because of grace, that debt has been taken care of? And that when you take that grace, when you take that grace, it begins to change you. It begins to change your thinking. It begins to change your outlook. It changes your perspective on life. So we must walk in grace to experience the grace. So if I want to have grace and more grace in my life, I actually have to walk in that grace. I have to do what he did and I actually have to take that grace and I have to go out into the world and extend that grace there. If I don't extend grace, that impacts my ability to receive grace. Why? Because here's the thing, if I have grace, grace changes me without me changing myself, right? You're right, grace, radioactive, it changes me. If I'm not changed, then here's the question. Did I really ever accept grace? See, it's one thing to accept the theological concept of grace. It's one thing to sing about grace. It's quite another thing to live in grace. It's quite another thing to walk in grace. Here's what James 4, 6 says. God gives us more and more grace, which is power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency and all others fully. Everybody say fully. That is why he says God sets himself against the proud and haughty, but gives us grace continually to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. I love this idea that God gives us grace, grace, and more grace. But he has to get us to a place where we're willing to accept that grace. Because only when we're willing to accept that grace... Are we able to be healed? Only when we are at a place where we have to accept that grace are we then able to extend that grace to other people, which then causes healing for other people. See, this is the thing I need you to understand. It's not just about how it makes you feel. It's about how it changes us and transforms us to be agents of healing and grace around us. The people that are sitting next to you in this church need you to understand grace. The people that aren't here need you to accept grace. The people that are out in this world need you to understand and accept grace. Because it's only when you understand it and accept it and grow in it that you are able to give it out to them. And let me tell you something, if the whole world was dying and you had the cure... Wouldn't you give it to them? Isn't it your responsibility to give it to them? And what if the cure was always sitting right in front of you? Penicillin was, came about from what? Mold in a refrigerator. What if the cure was always in front of you, but you just actually had to open your eyes to pay attention to where the cure was? Maybe you had to listen to what the cure actually was for each and every one of us. And then maybe you had to take the medicine. Because it's not enough to just hear about the medicine. I could talk about the medicine. I can sing about the medicine. But my friends, it's up to you to take the pill. It's up to you to take the pill and take it daily. Regularly there. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This is what it looks like to live a life of grace with one another. Go back to that. Be completely humble and gentle, patient. Isn't that how God is with us? Humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another with love. This is more like how you guys say it bearing with one another with love. Because that's what it feels like half the time, right? How many times can you get offended in a day? Oh, you, got, you turn on social media, you get offended. Turn on the news, you get offended. Talk to people, you get offended. We're always offended. But this says, if I got grace, I'm going to bear with you in love. I'm always going to be sharing love with you and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. 
So what's the necessity of forgiveness in terms of living out the Christian life? It's everything there. Because you don't have enough of Jesus to get into heaven. But you won't have enough of Jesus to live with heaven here on earth. And isn't that what we pray in that prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Aren't I praying for God's kingdom to come into this world? And where does God's kingdom need to come first? It needs to come first within me. It needs to come first within my heart. And so Jesus tells us, and by the way, the person that got upset about the prodigal son's story, I said, you might want to take it up with God. I didn't write it. Not my story, just preaching it. But Mark eleven twenty five, 25, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. Whenever you pray, you have to start off your prayer with forgiveness. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. And Matthew 6, 15, God says, If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And you go, well, what's that got to be? Again, that doesn't sound like grace, right? Grace is supposed to be free given. So why is all of a sudden God taking that back? Because here's the thing. You didn't really accept grace if you can't give it. You don't really have it if you can't give it. That's a hard truth for a lot of us to recognize. That maybe we never had it. But don't you want it? Don't you want something different? Don't you want that ability to forgive even the unforgivable? And by the way, sometimes this is one of the hardest things is sometimes you have to forgive something someone has done 10, 20 years ago. Maybe those people aren't even living anymore. But you still got to forgive them. You still got to forgive no matter what because forgiveness, unforgiveness ends up becoming the shackle on my life. And just because someone did something to hurt me doesn't mean I need to perpetuate that hurt any longer. I can be a healing, uh, I can be an agent of healing in my life, and I can also be an agent of healing in other people's lives if I will take the grace pill and forgive. Forgive myself, forgive other people, because God has forgiven me, and there is no greater master than He. There is no power above Him or beside Him. So if He says, You're forgiven, are you forgiven? Done. And if he has forgiven you, do you have any right to hold bitterness and unforgiveness toward anyone else? No. You have surrendered your right to be right the minute you realize you were wrong and you took the grace pill to be made right. Grace requires both hands, and that's why you have to let go of the unforgiveness. See, some of us might take off the backpack from our back, but we'll hold it on in our hand because we're afraid to let go of it. We've gotten so used to it. I mean, after all, it's my precious. This backpack has been with me to Kenya. This backpack has been with me to Spain. It's been with me to Paris. It's been with me to China. It's been with me all over this globe. My precious little backpack. But my friends, it's not worth it, is it? It's not worth carrying it around. But only we can lay it down. God will not grab it from us. But God will gladly take it if we will offer it. And in exchange, he gives us grace. And you can only get grace when you hold it with both hands. As long as I'm trying to get grace over here and hold on to this over here, I've never experienced it. It's like taking a half of the medication that the doctor tells you to take. That's dumb. Not taking the medicine the doctor tells you to do, or I'm going to take half of what they said. Are you the doctor? No, just because you went on WebMD doesn't make you an expert. Just because you went to Sunday school doesn't make you an expert on grace. Just because you sat in a pew doesn't make you an expert on grace. You become an expert on grace by taking grace, grace, and more grace. And you take that grace and you give that grace. 
Unforgiveness robs us of the freedom to be able to walk in and with Christ. Matthew 5, 21, 22. You have heard that it was said of the, to the men of old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to and unable to escape the punishment imposed by the court. But I say to you that everyone who continues to be angry with his brother or harbors malice, enmity of heart against him shall be liable to and unable to escape the punishment imposed by the court. You know, uh, one of our friends in the church here, I won't, there because they're actually here, I won't say who it was, said to me, how do I forgive my enemies? And I said, the best way to forgive your enemies is by choosing not to have one. It's up to us to decide whether or not we're going to have an enemy. Somebody can call you an enemy, but Paul says as long as it depends on you, you live at peace with everyone. Just because someone calls you an enemy doesn't mean you have to call them one. Just saying. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27. When angry. Notice it doesn't say don't get angry. When angry. So you're going to get angry. Do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation. Oh, I feel that all the time. Your fury or indignation lasts until the sun goes down. Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity for him. Because the minute we allow that, that unforgiveness in our heart, you've got to take that thought captive and toss it out. Because it's bad for you. It's bad for you. It's kind of like a donut. It's bad for you. You don't want to eat too many of them. If you're going to have one, enjoy it. But don't eat too many of them and don't eat them before bedtime. You're supposed to stop eating around 7 o'clock at night. Don't eat after 7 o'clock at night. Don't get angry after 7 o'clock at night. That's your time to purify your system. Get it out. I've told you all this. I've told, I can't remember where, who I've told it to or whatever. But I've started saying three things out loud that I'm grateful for at night and three things out loud that I'm grateful for in the morning. And you know, uh, this past week, I forgot. I was so tired. I forgot and I fell asleep. I woke up at midnight. It was around midnight because I had to pee because I got peed like two or three times a night. That's my thing. And uh, anybody there with me? You, you all got those bladders, right? You got to pee. And I went, oh, Lord, I forgot to say my thank yous. So in the dark at midnight, I said, thank you, Lord, for this toilet. <laughs> thank you, Lord, that I even have a weak bladder that I can hold it for a moment in time and get to the toilet. And thank you, Lord, for this bed that I get to go back into. Good night. And I wake up in the morning and I say three more things. And you know, how many of you go, oh, I got to go to work today. Or maybe some of you, a lot of you are retired, but I got to go to work today. Now I go, thank you, Lord, I have a job to pay my bills. Thank you, Lord, for my daily bread. Thank you, Lord. See, you can turn all those things into thank you. And then I even go, oh, my past and all that stuff. And I go, you know what? Thank you, God, for all that stuff. I wish I didn't have to go through it. But I know you got me through it. And I know that you're teaching me through it even now. We can always be a thankful people. Do not let anger rob you. Do you recognize that anger is a passive emotion? And this is what I mean. When you're angry at something, it's something that just happened. That, or happened before. It didn't happen now, it happened before. Because now is now. So I'm angry, I'm letting something that happened a moment before affect me in my now. So now, now, so now, it took for me then, and I'm allowing to take from me now. It's not worth it. It's totally not worth it. It just robs us of joy. Rachel Held Evans says this, Jesus invites us to embrace suffering, to embrace struggle, and to embrace even death, to take the way of peace over the sword, the way of grace over retribution, the way of sacrifice over excess, the way of love over hate, and the way of surrender over over control. Forgiveness is the path of true freedom. Matthew 5.48 In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously. 
and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. And we recognize that Jesus tells us a defining part of who we are is that we are peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. It's time to make peace with God, make peace with ourselves, and make peace with one another. What time do you have? Anybody? I'm glad you didn't bring a watch. What? 11.54? I still got a little bit of time. No, just kidding, just kidding. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for showing us what true forgiveness is with Jesus Christ. Thank you for offering to take all of our weight, all of our sin, and all of our shame. Help us, Father, to live in the freedom that is offered to each and every one of us. The freedom of grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You wanna say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really.